so many things we have to run after. We have to chase after stuff and pursue this and pursue that. But when you serve God, and why I love serving Jesus Christ, is because David said, goodness and mercy is going to follow behind me. That I don't have to chase after it, it'll chase me down. That's the love of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about here today? I said the love of God is his goodness and his mercy that will overtake you. It'll run you down. Stuff you don't deserve, he'll do it for you. You don't have to run after God's goodness. You don't have to run after his mercy. The Bible says new mercies we see every morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm praising him today because I got some new mercy today. Come on, amen. Because there's some things that I said and did and thought yesterday that disqualifies me today. But because mercy got up with me this morning, I can get up too. Glory to God. There were some things that disqualified me from being standing here week after week after week back in 20 years and 25 and 30 years ago. But goodness and mercy caught up with me. Y'all don't hit me today. Changed my life move things around and I spend the rest of my life trying to make sure other folk know that as well. To know that goodness and mercy will catch up with you and follow you. We're always afraid that our past will follow with us. But I'm so glad that, that even if the past catches up with you, goodness and mercy will take over. Take hold. Y'all don't hear me today. <laughs> yes! God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's goodness and mercy, amen, overtakes us. And we're so thankful and grateful for what God's going to do. Let's give this choir a hand one more time. Thank you all for those of you who are joining us online. We hope that you'll enjoy the rest of this service today. It's a special day. We'll be taking communion and just later on in our service because today we're going to be talking about forgiveness. We're in our series on simplifying our lives, and there's no greater way to simplify our life and declutter our life and get the, the junk out of the trunk, to get the, the hurt and the... And the, and the, and the grudge-ism and the, and, the, and the pain that we may feel and we sense, amen, and what has, been, what has happened to us and afflicted us. Some of us can't move forward because we're still stuck in yesterday. We're still holding people, amen, hostage in our heart and our mind. And he, didn't, he or she done moved on and got a new family. Come on, amen. You do a drive-by by that house, they, they having fun in the yard. They got, amen, and you still bitter in your car driving by. They done married somebody else. <laughs> and you're angry and you're upset. And, and what God wants to do is he wants you to, to get over that so that you can get on with what he has prepared for you. Come on, amen. And so I, I believe, amen, that today's message can be life-changing for some of us on today as we hear and heed the word of God and what God has to say to us. And then at the end, we'll have communion last service we did the same thing but we were able to do a baptism in the midst of our communion service amen come on let's give God a shout of praise there's no no greater demonstration than being baptized being risen to new life having your sins forgiven your life amen restored through the blood and life of Jesus Christ if we would turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 we'll start uh, in chap in verse number 29 is I believe that's where I want to go uh, Ephesians chapter 4 it's our custom to stand for the reading of the Word of God when you found it. If you would turn in the New Testament book of Ephesians, Ephesians is right after um, you get to Galatians, and then you'll find Ephesians there if you thumb in through. Ephesians chapter number 4, and we'll be looking at verse 29. Paul is, has so much to say in this great, great book, one of the great books of the Bible, and, um, and we'll spend some time in it. Hopefully you're joining one of our small groups that we have uh, at 9.45 or Wednesday nights. Uh, they're meeting 7 o'clock in the mornings on Sundays. They're in different spaces and places all over Metro Atlanta as well. I'd uh, love for you to be a part of that where you can, um, you can dissect what we're talking about. Amen. Different material than what I'm preaching and speaking on. Same topic, but it's different, if you would, material that you have. Uh, that Pastor Carl and uh, Minister Tawana did a wonderful job of putting together great curriculum for you all um, to be able to help you to, to digest, amen, what we are giving you during this 10-week Simplify series. Let's look, if you would, at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29. When you found it, say, I've got it. Bible says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So here's what God, God says, look, stop all that foolishness. Stop using your mouth to tear folk down. I've given you that grace, given you that opportunity to build people up. Make sure that what's coming out is wholesome. Think before you speak. You hear people say, you got two ears and one mouth. You ought to, you ought to listen twice as much as you speak. Amen. And, uh, and probably say half as much as you say. Come on, amen. And so look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He says, Holy Spirit has kept you here, sealed you, provided a home and a place for you in heaven. Amen. Not for you to go around and tear folk down and have, uh, if you would, your life not being a good char character of Christ. Amen. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It burdens the Holy Spirit. You know what burdens the Holy Spirit is that stuff. What burdens the Holy Spirit is unwholesome talk. Yes, he's grieved by other things that we see, but the thing that grieves the Holy Spirit, amen, is when, when believers are not acting like believers. And they're, and they're holding grudges. They're, they're using their, what God has graced us with and blessed us with to be able to tear down instead of building up. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit weeps. The Holy Spirit is a person, third person of the Trinity, and he grieves over how we treat one another. The climate that's in this culture, in this country right now, in this whole world, the, the climate that's in families and in churches and communities and in jobs and offices and all that, it grieves him. So, so, so how do we, what do we need to do? Look what he says. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. He said, that ain't what you, you got to get rid of that. You got to get the junk out the trunk. You got to declutter your life. I can't bring new relationships in because you, you got so much baggage and drama and whatever. I can't entrust new people to you because you're a malice, you're a slanderous, you're a bitter person, and I can't bring new people into your life. I have new blessings. I have new mercies. I have, I have things that's been running behind you, goodness and mercy, and we just sung about it's chasing you down, but I can't let goodness and mercy, amen, uh, 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 be resident in your life because you're, you're toxic. Because even if I put goodness and mercy, you'll turn it into something negative. You're, you're, you're contaminant. You're, you're, you're contaminant. And so I have to keep, even though, and I still got it chasing behind you. Goodness and mercy is still chasing behind you. But I can't let it catch up with you. Because if I let goodness and mercy come with you, you, you you're, you're so contaminated, you'll destroy it. Or you won't appreciate it. Or, or, and, so, and, and, so, and so therefore, and so you got to get rid of all that stuff. And this is what you got to do. Here's what you will replace it with because it's not enough to just get rid of stuff. You got to replace it with something else. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Here, here, here's the crux of our message today. Forgiving each other just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. He says, be kind and compassionate one to another. He, I, don't, I don't expect you to go through life and everybody going to treat you right. Because there's going to be some people who treat you wrong. I mean, dirt wrong. But I'm not expecting you to act like them. I expect you to be compassionate. I, I expect you to be kind. And I expect you to be forgiving. Not holding grudges. Not what we see. And I want you to do that. Why? Why should I do that? Because I did it to you. I didn't save you because, hey amen, you were perfect. I saved you because you was just a crazy, dirty dog. And I did it while you, I didn't wait until you got together and didn't give you my grace. I gave it to you while you were, amen, yet a sinner. And so you need to make sure that you don't make people try to be perfect before you forgive them. Just like I did you, that's what you do to other folk. You treat people like I treated you. And I didn't wait for you to get cleaned up. I didn't wait for you to get out the gutter. I didn't wait for you to clean up your mouth. I didn't wait for your mind to be all together. Amen. And so you do just what I did for you to other folk. Oh, Lord. Turn to your neighbor and tell it's going to be a long day. <laughs> Father, we pray you'll bless us today with your word. Thank you for what you're saying to us today. Help us, Lord God, to get the clutter of out of our soul, 
so that we'll be able to receive everything we need to do. Our spirit cannot soar because our soul is weighing us down. Our spirit cannot take us to the highest heights that you have for us because we have, we need of soul, we'll need of, in need of soul salvation. Soul salvation, our emotions, our intellect, our will has been, Lord God, weighted down because of the, because of the, the, the malice and the anger and the wrath that we carry with us every day. So t lift us up, as the song said, where we belong. High above, Lord God, the, the, the foolishness that has been done to us. Let us, Lord God, learn today how to forgive and why we need to forgive and get busy doing it. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's children shouted amen. amen and amen. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. I want to title this message, Secret of an Uncluttered, Uncluttered Soul. The Secret of an Uncluttered Soul. An uncluttered soul that is able to accept people, take people for who they are, love people for whatever uh, however they present themselves in life, an uncluttered soul that has room for more. That This Simplify series is about making room for more, decluttering our lives so that we'll have room to accept what God has for us. Many of us, amen, cannot uh, accept the new things that God has for us because we're still trapped in yesterday, yesteryear, still holding grudges, still rehearsing, nursing wounds, we need to make sure that we get rid of those offenses and those things that hold us down and hold us back. And so we, we need to do that. And it's hard to do it. But when we see forgiveness, when we actually see forgiveness take place, it is an amazing thing. Have you ever seen somebody forgive somebody? Have you ever, been, I mean, actually been a party and witnessing, you've forgiven, and, 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 or you've been, a, you've been a recipient of it, either the person who's the offender or the offendee, and maybe it happens and sometimes you're not able to see it as complete as it is when you're a party of it. And it's kind of interesting when you actually see it and witness it and others doing it. It's amazing. The truth of the matter is sometimes it's confusing to us because some of the people who forgive some stuff, we go, wow, they forgave that. And, 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 it, and, it, and it makes us look at ourselves and make the small stuff that we're holding against people seem very, very small. Because we're saying, wow, they forgave them for all that, that they did. And I'm holding a grudge for, because somebody didn't speak to me. You know, <laughs> or, or because of, of something I suspect or I think. Come on, you know, and don't even know if it's truly true or not. I mean, you know, I, 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 or I have, I, I, I'm holding grudges because of something somebody really did. But is it really worth the relationship being destroyed over that? That I know it happened. Uh, and, 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 and when we see forgiveness being done, it is, it is, it is uh, often very, very um, telling of where we are. It, it becomes a mirror to, to who we are, to, uh, 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 if you would, a, uh, 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 an opportunity, a door into our window, into our soul, to see kind of why can't I do that? Because when I see other people forgive, sometimes I put myself in that and I ask myself, could I have done that? And, and, I, and sadly to say, I know y'all are more spiritual than I am, sadly to say, so, some, sometimes I go, wow, I got a long way to go. Because I don't know if I could have forgiven that easily and that quickly. I want to show you something, a man, that uh, happened last year, uh, end of last year. Uh, while I was in the hospital dealing, recovering from my heart surgery and all those things, I got a chance to follow the, uh, the, the trial of, um, of Amber Geiger, uh, who, who, who walked into um, an apartment thinking that it was her own apartment in Dallas and she walked into the apartment and she um, uh, thought that the person sitting on his couch in his own room, in his own home, was in her home because she said she was so tired that she missed the, you know, didn't know they, they lived, um, uh, she lived on the, uh, either the floor above or beneath him and so she thought she was at her apartment. When she opened the door, uh, there was a man sitting on the couch and she shot and killed him, thinking that he was a burglar. Well, she was tried um, for this, and she ultimately, through a process, she was actually, sent, uh, actually uh, found guilty by uh, a, a jury, and um, it was rumored that it would be about 10 years she would get for doing this. 
and five years, within five years, she'd be up for parole. A lot of people were having a lot of issues with what the judge kind of given a little bit of a, a precursor to what the sentencing may have been. A lot of people were upset about it. Well, right before they sentence, they have the, the family who has been injured come in to the courtroom and give an impact statement. Impact, this is the impact of the, the death of our loved one, the, uh, of whatever it is, what the cost has been to our family. And, and oftentimes the family wants to make sure that the person uh, gets the maximum, if you would, that is allowed by the law in order uh, to uh, not avenge, but to make sure that the person is paying the full weight of the consequences of their actions. And so many of the family members were getting up, and I was watching this, and, and getting the family members coming up, coming up, coming up, and sharing, you know, I believe, you know, I, that she said this and this and this. Uh, story changed a little bit throughout the trial. I, 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 I believe she's sorry now and all that stuff, but yet I still believe she needs to have, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I was hearing it. Some people were angry. Some not as so angry. And, and what was amazing and what hit the news and was on, like, the top one or two stories for days in all news stories, amen, all over the country, was when the brother of, of, of uh, Bothan. Bothan was the one who was shot. The, his brother, a man, um, Brant, got up and uh, in his impact statement, he made this statement, and it really shocked the world, and I want us to look at, if you haven't seen it, amen, I want to expose you to it now. If you'd play that for us. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just, I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt all the, things, the bad things you may have done in the past, each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know, I can speak for myself, I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes.
I wanted to play that throughout the whole hug because some part of me rejoices with what I saw, but there's another part of me that, that flesh part of me that goes, gosh, that's quick. I'm not sure if I could do that. There's a flesh part of me, and maybe you feel it as well, having seen things over the history of time, particularly in my race, most of us are African Americans, and we've seen so much injustice done and so much stuff, and I'm like, ooh, I don't know about that. I mean, what if the, if the, if the wheels had been turned and it had been two different folk, if, if, if both of them had walked in to, to her, her, her job, would, it been, would the sentence, would, would the trial have been so quick? What, what would have been the response? And, and, and I'm conflicted. Can I just be honest? There's a conflict. But yet there's this Christian side, this, this, this greater angel of me, this, this, this preacher, pastor part of me that goes, that's what forgiveness looks like. And then there's the Tyrone side that goes, Ugh. maybe you're spiritual, more spiritual than I am. Because I've had to sit in, in courtrooms with, with families who's had their, their children shot, killed. I mean, and then lie about it and then go through a whole trial knowing that they buried a, a gun, knowing that they've been lying, amen, and, 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 and misrepresenting, and you sit there with the family, and you hear liars lie and all this stuff, and you see the person sitting there and going, just tell the truth. And they sit there like they're innocent. And even as a preacher, you sit there and go, you know, I know some, I got a cousin for $20. I had a good cousin, and for 20 bucks, they'll make this problem go away. That's the Tyrone side. The Christian side even prays for the person sitting in the defendant's chair, even while I'm sitting with the family in the family section, and I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. I, I think this young man, he was conflicted too. He didn't arrive at that overnight. That, that kind of forgiveness didn't come because he just sat in a thing and just felt it. This young man has been wrestling with the two sides of who we are. And to me, nothing shows the story better than that right there because it's fresh in our community. It's fresh in, in, in the minds of, of, of this nation, amen, right now because that, that juxtaposition, that, that, that conflict is, is, is real. And, and you don't have to have somebody killed, amen, like, like, like the family had. You, you can have issues in your family, in your, in, your, in, with, in, your, in your work environment, in your church, in your community, in your, in your fraternity, in sorority. You can have these same kind of conflicts and, 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 and feel that same kind of tension that he felt. Because it's like, what side of me is going to win out? And I, and I always hope the angel side is going to win out. Because there's that little devil side, they says, you know, that little, you know, one on the shoulder. You don't need to let go of this. But the angel side says, you know, you, you know that's not who you are. You know you're changed and you're delivered. And I am always, um, I, all, I, all, I, I don't always, I, but I always want to land on the side of angels. I always want to do that. That's my hope. But can I tell you, that journey is not an easy journey. It's not a straight, linear line. Sometimes it's this. <laughs> Sometimes I feel it, and then I think of it, and then, oh, come on, and then it goes, come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about here today? So don't let these preachers or these people make you feel like, you know, you just see something, or you read a text, you read what we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 32, and then all of a sudden, you know, you just kind of do it. Because that's magic. That's not ministry. That's not real life. Because real life it's this. It's I'm feeling okay now, and then I feel bad, and then I'm okay, and then I feel bad, and I think about it, and I feel that's part of the process of recovery. It's what we teach and celebrate recovery. is a it's a process, and and what people go through to get through drug addiction and alcohol addiction and whatever people who have to get through anger and bitterness and malice and forgiveness. It's the same 
Some of y'all need to come to celebrate recovery just because you need to come to get over some of your anger and your bitterness. It's not for you to get out of drugs or alcoholism or any kind of other ism. You need to come so you can stop being mad at your mama or your daddy. So you can, you can, you can embrace. I had some people in between last service, as I, after I preached this, I had people, had a line of people just coming and just confessing. Uh, my, I don't know, I, I, I want relationship with my kids. I want my mom, with my brother, with my family, with people, and they're hurting. And they don't know, what do I do? How do we, how do I actualize what you preach today? Well, 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 we're going to talk about some of that, and I'm not sure if I'm going to answer all your questions, but I think we'll at least get you a good start. Because you've got to forgive. You cannot live in this life and not forgive. Because you're not going to live in this life and not be offended. There, there, my wife, and we did a new members class today with a, a whole room full of new members, amen, that are going through. And my wife, I was listening, I came in when she was doing her part, and she was like, you are not, this is not a perfect church. If you think you joined a perfect church, you need to leave it. You, you, if, and if you ever find one, if you ever find a purple church, she said, don't ever join it because you'll mess that church up because we're not perfect people. We're going, to, uh, we're going to offend you. We're going to disappoint you. We're not going to return your call sometimes. We're not going to be able to respond to an email as quick as you want to. We're not going to be able to pay your benevolence bills and things like that. There are going to be times that you're going to be ticked off. And you're going to have to learn to forgive in a church, in a company, in a family, you're going to even have to learn how to forgive yourself because sometimes the hardest person for us to forgive is us. <laughs> so all of us, if you're breathing, you're going to have to learn how to deal with forgiveness. You've got to deal with hurt and problems and situations. And you can't just extend forgiveness to people who are what we call, quote, unquote, important people. Because we treat people differently. You know, we, we treat people uh, who, who have certain, if you would, um, positions or certain um, status. We, we have a different, um, you know, way in which we operate with them. And then we treat the lower people, what we think in our mind, lower people differently. Well, I ain't got to worry about them. But that's, that's different from what the Bible says. You know, yes, the Bible does say, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. Yeah, you're supposed to respect leaders above you on your job and your church and different areas of responsibility. Yes, you ought to do that. But let me tell you where the harshest, amen, um, the harshest criticism comes, not to the people who mistreat people who are sitting in high places of authority. It comes when you, take care, when you don't take care and you don't love and you don't respect the lowest of the low, the left over, the looked over, the left out. Here's what the Bible says, Jesus said, if you hurt one of my little ones, if you offend one of them, if, if, if you do something, amen, to hurt them, to hinder them, to, 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 to slow the progress of faith and Christianity in their life, amen, and, and, you, and you do that, you, you, you might as well tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the, sh into the sea. Because, he, it, it, because, because you have to, amen, make sure that... that, that, that how do I say this? Let me say it this way. That you, that you forgive the people who don't really matter to you the most. And perhaps the, 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 the level of Christianity you have and maturity, maturity that you have is not how you treat people who you, everybody expects you to treat right. It's about how do you treat and how do you forgive the people who really don't matter. <laughs> That's good stuff. It is. That your character may be more revealed in how you treat, amen, strangers. And other, that's why, amen, the book Hebrew, Hebrew writer says, be careful how you entertain strangers because sometimes you think it's a stranger and it's an angel. And it's just a test to see how you handle people who you don't think you need. Because people who we think we need, we treat them differently. But people who we don't think we need, we just kind of push them off. Oh, y'all, am I helping anybody already there? <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, the stuff I had to say, this, I don't know. This, we'll see what God's saying today. I may not get through all of this. We got to make sure that we treat people right. And in fact, I haven't had you turn to your neighbor in a long time. Why don't you turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, you need to be careful how you treat me because I'm one of God's favorites. You need to be careful how you talk to me. You better be careful how you overlook me. You better be careful because I'm one of God's favorites and I serve a God who says he'll take care. Be careful. 
<laughs> I don't care who it is. You treat everybody with, with respect. You give everybody that respect. Why do I need to forgive? Well, because I've been forgiven. I mean, I mean here, here, Paul's point in Ephesians 4.32 is the reason why you forgive because you have been. You got it, give it to somebody else. You receive forgiveness, therefore, it is required and expected of you that you can forgive. And, and here's the beauty of forgiveness when it comes to Jesus Christ. You now have a new power to forgive once you've been forgiven. Because God not only forgives us, he now resides and lives in us and now gives us the power to do what we could not do in the flesh. So it becomes easier to be able to move to the side of the angels than the side of the demons. Because now I have a power I have a strength, I have, I have the spirit of God to be able to aid me to do what I could not do in the flesh. The old Tyrone, before salvation, before Jesus Christ, might have, amen, cussed everybody out and, tr and treated people and, and held grudges, but now I've got a spirit of God living on the inside of me. I got the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, I got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost now compels me and gives me a power to do what I could not do in the flesh. Glory to God. And so now I, I, I can do what I could not do. And, and, and I have seen it done because it was done to me. It's easier. Forgiveness is more caught than taught. Forgiveness is more caught than taught. I can teach it. I'm going to teach today about forgiveness and some different steps and da, 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 some things, all this. Oh, that's great. It's going to be good. But, but, but really, the way I learn forgiveness and we learn forgiveness the best is when we have received it and understand it and what has been done to us. And what Paul says is, because you've been forgiven, you ought to be able to forgive. You know what it looks like. It removes the excuse. It removes the excuse. Because the truth of the matter is, you know yourself. And you know what you've been forgiven of. Things you've never confessed or told anybody about when you, you've been forgiven by God. And man, you know, when you really sit back and think about that, when you think about what you used to be, what we used to say in, in North Carolina, what you used to was, when you think about what you used to was and who you used to be, Paul does this whole list, amen, and he talks about all these different people, sinners, this, 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 and he says, and such were some of you. When he starts listing this whole list of all these terrible sins and all these different people, and then he says, and you used to be like that? You don't need to forget where you came from. You don't need to forget, amen, uh, how God picked you up out of the gutter and he made you who you are today, and I dare you to be able to hold stuff against people because you've been forgiven much, you need to forgive much. So we need to take account of ourselves. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. Because when you understand your area of forgiveness, man, it just makes it, it doesn't make it easy, it makes it easier. And then you, and, and, and you just, you, you, you are so grateful, you want to lavish on people and lavish on Christ. Tell you what a forgiveness will do. Forgiveness will, will take your worship to a whole nother level. Some of us can't worship God the way we need to worship God because we're so tied down to earth, we can't reach our hands up to heaven. We, we, we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. And, 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 and so when you really understand forgiveness, it will, it will alter your worship experience. It'll alter the way you see Jesus. It'll alter the, what you're willing to sacrifice and what you're willing to give up. You, the things you thought you needed, you don't need no more because you have understood what forgiveness is because you yourself have been forgiven. And it's almost like a weight has been lifted off of you. And then the things you thought you needed, you don't need no more. That's the woman with the, the alabaster box in the book of uh, Luke chapter 7. It's great because she, she comes into a room full of preachers and potentates and all these folk in Simon's house, amen, and there she, there she is, amen, and she comes in, amen, and some folk don't, know, don't think she ought to be there and they certainly don't believe she ought to be doing what she's doing. But she's in the room, and she's in there with Jesus. We don't know her name necessarily. Some believe it's Mary. That was, there were four accounts in all four Gospels. This story is told, but it's two women, two different ladies. Amen. Mary, the, uh, the, the, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, is one who does it. But this is the woman, this, this one that Luke's talking about is a different woman, different Mary, because the Bible calls her a woman who is, who is, who is an offender of the law. She is a, how do I say, a, 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 um, she's, she's a prostitute probably. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she, she's, she's, she's a woman of the world. 
And, and, and so she comes into the room. Others don't believe she ought to be there in the first place. And she comes in, and she has somehow encountered Jesus, maybe outside of the house, or maybe just her encounter the first time with him in the house. But whatever it is, she gets around Jesus, and everything changes because he treats her totally different than any other person has ever done it before. And when she meets Jesus and she encounters Jesus, she takes the perfume that was in her alabaster box, and she breaks it open, and she pours it on him. It, the stuff that she used to put on her body to cover herself, to cover the stench of her, of her prostituting life, to make herself acceptable to men. The stuff that she used to put on, her mask, her, her stuff. You know, we do that, right? We, we put on stuff to make ourselves look better than we really are. But when she meets Jesus and she sees that he accepts her, that she didn't have to put that stuff on herself, she puts it on him. And saying, here's a man who loves me for who I am, who knows me, because Jesus knows everything about everybody when he meets him. She, she knows immediately, this man knows my life, he knows who I am, and he looks at me with love, not judgment. He looks at me with love, not lust. And for the first time, she realizes, I don't have to pretend. I don't have to cover myself with, with this expensive ointment to be acceptable by people. And she takes it and she throws it, puts it on him. This, and listen, what was so important was it was worth a year's salary. This wasn't just something you got from Walmart's Super Save Owl on clearance after Christmas. This was a year's worth of perfume. And she says, I don't need it anymore. Because what forgiveness does is forgiveness gets us to a place where we say, what I thought I needed to make myself feel like I'm somebody, I don't need it anymore because I've been around the one who make me feel like I'm everything. And so I don't need, y'all don't hear me today. I don't need all that. And forgiveness with Jesus made her throw and give him all that oil over and it turned into worship. She began to worship him. That's why I say your worship will go to another level when you let go of stuff. She didn't worry about who was in the room. She didn't worry about what the folks thought. They, they were talking about, I can't believe she's doing all that ex expensive stuff on him. Why is she in the room? Who is she? What, what, she doesn't look like the rest of us. She doesn't fit here. But when you get around Jesus and he forgives you, 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 you realize I count, I matter. And whatever it was that you were holding to make you feel important, or, amen, you just lay it at his feet and you give it to him and say, no, Lord, I... Forgiveness, amen, freedom, amen, has made me who I am because you see me for who I am and love me anyhow. Many of us can't do that, though, because we're very suspicious and judgmental of people. And a lot of it is because of what we've experienced from people. I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to criticize you because I do it, we all do it, all of us do it, we're judging folk. People say, I'm not prejudiced, I'm not, I don't judge, yes, you do. You know, we all judge. We make judgments. We make judgments based often upon past or maybe the behavior of that individual or individuals that, we, uh, that, 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 that may be like them or we may suspect. And so we become these very suspicious people. And but what forgiveness does, it doesn't, it doesn't make you close in. It makes you open up. And you become this. We believe this lady might have been Mary Magdalene. The one who, she, if, if that is true, if this is the Mary Magdalene, a man who had seven demons inside of her, if this is her and Jesus is the one who had, who had forgiven her and cleansed her of seven demons inside of her, man, this woman's life changed forever for what he did to release her from that pit of despair. And when you realize that you've been forgiven so much, man, you're so freed up. You'll follow Jesus. You'll run after him. You'll love other folk. You won't be so suspicious. You'll be open-hearted. I'm not saying you're going to let folk run over you and walk over you. That's not it. But you know what? If they do, it won't matter. It won't matter as much. It matters, but it won't matter as much. Because I know I serve a God, a man, who will take care of me. And I don't have to try to defend myself because he becomes my defender. So I relinquish my right to get even. Part of forgiveness, I mean, I'm, it, that was all introduction. Let's get to the sermon. Okay, here. We are, I'm going to to relinquish our right, amen, to get even with people. Because some of us love to get even. You do something to some people, I'm going to get them back. I'm going to get them back. They got it coming. And we like people to stay in fear that we're going to come after them. And that is such a demonic, that is such a demonic position to hold. 
to, to make people afraid of you. How are you going to share your faith? How are you going to be a believer that's going to make an impact and you have a spirit that you want people to be afraid of you? I'm going to get folk back. But not do nothing to me, I'm going to get you back. That's not the spirit that God wants. God, God, God wants the spirit of us, amen, that if I get slapped on one side, I'll, I'll turn the cheek. Not, not to be taken, I know y'all, that's, that stuff is hard, and, and I didn't mean to get into all this now, because it's like, wait a minute, I ain't letting nobody slap me. I'm from the streets. I'm from Chicago. I'm from, I'm from Bank, Bankhead on the other side of Atlanta. That ain't how we were raised, Pastor. I'm not, that is not what Jesus, he is not saying turn the other cheek and let people take, somebody steal your coat, give them their cloak as well. He's not saying let people run over you. He's not saying that. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the position of our heart. And they slap me on the other side, but if the opportunity presents itself where I have to position myself to be a help to them, I will still offer myself. I will not close myself down to where I'll say, I'll never walk through that door again. Don't ever do that. Don't ever go through life and say, you know, I'll never walk through. That person did that to me, I'll never talk to them again. No, you, 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 you may not ever have that relationship again because forgiveness is not always about restoration. It's not always about getting back to what the relationship used to be. But you, in forgiveness, you say the door still is still open. I may not, you may not be able to walk through it. We may not ever have a relationship we had before, but I, I, I reserve the right for you to change and for me to trust you again, but you're going to have to prove it. And so what Jesus is saying, we're turning the cheek. It is not for you to be a, a, punch, a bunching, punching bag, but it's for you to say, I will never close the door to the opportunity that we serve a God who has such gr mighty grace, that he has such mighty mercy, that he is so good, that he is so perfect in restoring people, that he can restore you to a place where I can trust you again to even extend my cheek. Good God Almighty. <laughs> it, it, it's not about the other person or even about your ability. What, what I believe the turning the cheek is about is about my faith in God who's able to change your heart and change my heart to where somehow with all the mess that we went through, we might be able to still be together at some point. Be friends. That's good stuff. I, I'm, I'm going to get this tape myself. I'm going to listen to this myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it means but we live in a world today that we don't do that we love to get even I'm going to get you back here's what Romans 12 19 says never avenge yourselves leave that to God for he has said that he will repay those who deserve it God knows the motives and the intentions of the hearts of men that's not our we don't know we don't know what pain people hurting people hurt people the people who hurt people are people who are hurt themselves. And we don't know the dimensions of the pain that somebody has. God does. That's why you have to leave it up to him. Because he's the one who's able to. So many of you, are, you got to release people and relinquish the right to get even. And respond to evil with good. Luke 6, 27, 28 says, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. How you know you're being healed is when you can start praying for folk. And praying, God bless them. God bless them, bless them. Joseph in the Bible, in, in, in Book of Genesis, it writes, it, it's, 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 it's a Book of Genesis, he's the, the greatest narrative or the longest narrative is on Joseph in the Book of Genesis, not Abraham or, or, or Noah or, or any of those guys, Adam. It is, it is really Joseph. It's the story of Joseph. And, and, and a really part of his story is not just about getting the land and doing all this stuff. It's about forgiveness. It's about being wronged by his brothers being wronged by Potiphar and his wife, being wronged in the prison by the butler and, 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 the, uh, and the baker, is being wronged over and, in, and coming to a place of prominence where he can now do something. His brothers are there, there's a famine in the land, he could destroy them. They, they don't know it's him. He's, he's got on Egyptian clothing, they don't know it's him. And they're standing there and, they're, and he's like, here's all the folk that did that dirt to me, let me stomp on them like a roach. And I'm gonna tell you, he had he had that, you, you see that old man part of him and then the new Joseph. The, the, the one that has been kept and covered by God and favored by God and the one who says, I've been waiting uh, for an opportunity to get these boys who threw me in a pit and left me to die. Sold me into slavery later. I, I wanna, I wanna, I, 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 you know, cause you know, how many of y'all have little stories in your mind? Well, if I ever see them again, here's what's gonna happen. Y'all ever had that? 
You know, some people in college or high school, or some folk in the family or last year's family reunion, they did something to you. You kind of, I can't wait till next July 4th because I'm going to get that cousin, I'm going to get that auntie, I'm going to sit them down and I'm going. And the whole year you've been waiting for July 4th family reunion so you can tell them off. And Joseph is in that situation. And here's what he does. He lets his angels take over. He, 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 he realizes I can't hold this and hold this position at the same. I can't hold angry with, angry with you and holding what God has brought into my life at the same time. I, I don't have that much room. It's cluttering up my life. I can't hold the blessings that God has given to me. I can't hold this new position. I can't hold all this responsibility and anger at you at the same time. So something's got to go. And I'm not going to lose my job. So I got to lose this hurt. Oh, y'all don't hear me. And so, and so what happens is he, 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 he sits down with them and he, he lets them, he first finds out what kind of story. Tell, tell me about your family. They tell everything about everybody. They tell them all about their family, all about their family. And then when they come to talking about, uh, yeah, we got this other brother. He ain't with us no more. They don't tell the full story about who he was. They don't tell the story. They're not ready to be honest. And there's some people who you try to go to and they're not ready to be honest with the full story. And, and sometimes what we do is we quit right then. Well, I asked them, we went in, we started having a conversation, and they started going to test the line. <laughs> you know, testify, test the lie. <laughs> they, they start lying, or they have, they have alternative facts. And that's not the real truth. But what most of us do when that happens, what we do is we shut down and say, I'm through. We close. What Joseph does is he goes a little deeper. He says, okay. He goes out the room, he, he goes through some stuff, he weeps and he cries, he kind of gets himself together, he gets his emotions together because he doesn't respond out of emotion. He comes back and he continues the conversation and he eventually says, now what we're going to do is we're going to put truth on the table because what we're not going to do if we're going to continue this relationship, or if we're going to even have some kind of way to get over this, amen, situation, if I'm going to have a way to be able to get out of this and not have this bitterness in my heart, then I, I got to have some truth on the table. So what we're not going to do is pretend I didn't exist. And what we're going to do is, not, is, is pretend that you didn't try to hurt me. So the truth of the matter is, I'm Joseph. They scared him to death. Oh, my God. I'm the brother you said was just your brother? No, no, no. Let's tell the whole story. You, I'm the one y'all threw in the pit, and I'm the one y'all sold into the Midianites. And I'm the one that went to Egypt. And I'm the one that went to jail. And I'm the one, amen, who's now prime minister. And I'm the one with the power to just crush you. But I'm also the one who's so full of God's grace. I am also the one who's so full of God's mercy that I am the one that in spite of all that, what the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. I'm, I am also the one who will forgive you and I'll take care of you. I'm going to take care of your brothers. I'm going to take care of your kids. You don't have to be afraid of me. But we can't get to me taking care of y'all and making sure y'all are okay if we can't be truth, have some truth about what really happened. Because I'm not going to do all that. I'm not going to help y'all with all that if you're going to still perpetrate the fraud and the lie. Got to have real grown folk conversation. Woo, this is good stuff. I told y'all this is... And he has it with him. And he has it with them, not with other folk. He never talks to them about their family business with other Egyptians in the room. He always made sure they were out in the room because he didn't want what they were working with and what they were trying to deal with to affect other relationships outside of them. And many of us, we aren't that, we aren't that mature because what we want to do is we want to make sure everybody knows. Let me tell you. Somebody, somebody say something good about the person. Amen. Say, you know, you can't wait to tell. Well, you think they good? You think that he, you know, I'm going to say it's me. You know, Pastor Martin, you think Pastor Martin was good? That was a good preacher. Well, let me tell you about him. <laughs> let me tell you what he did to me. Because people don't want you to like the people that they hate. And they want to contend. That's demonic. It's the devil. That's him. That is who he is. That's how he got one third of the angels to, run, to leave heaven, to leave God. Because he was doing that. He got one third of people who are in the presence of God. Angels, not people, but angels who are in the presence of God to walk away from the true and living God. Because he played them kind of games. Same thing Absalom did to David. David's son, Absalom, went around at the gate and when everybody was leaving out of, out of worship service. 
He would tell him, I know my daddy was talking and he was doing that stuff, but he ain't nothing. And he ain't this and spreading all kind of lies. And so half of the kingdom started now not listening to David and saying, well, this is his son. And that's demonic. It's wrong. And David had to forgive his own child. Joseph had to forgive his brothers. Here's the question, who do you have to forgive? Who do you need to have a conversation with so that you can respond to them with good? Respond to them with good, not with evil. I know you want to lift a finger and, and you want to, you know, you want to roll that net, go off. And, 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 and no, it doesn't have, confrontation does not have to be, if you would, divisive. It doesn't have to be, but it does have to be true and real. And it doesn't happen all at one conversation. Here's what I love about Joseph and what I love about just forgiveness in my own life when I've had to do that. It's not one conversation because we have this fallacy to believe that it's just one conversation, that one conversation is going to fix it. And it does. sometimes it's several conversations. Notice in, 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 in Genesis when, when Joseph is having an issue, sometimes he's talking and, it, and they ain't telling the truth or, or it gets a little, the emotions get a little high. The Bible says he'll leave the room, he goes to cry, and then he'll come back. Or, or several days will pass. Or he'll have them go do something and come back, go get your brother Benjamin and come back. He, it was a process. It wasn't a one-time conversation. Don't spiritualize Joseph's uh, um, forgiveness as they had one conversation. He sat in the room. This thing took some time. And some of y'all have been injured and hurt so long, it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen because you hear a good sermon. And because you come up here and I take some oil and I lay it on your head, that is going to make you, all, all you have is a wet forehead. I'm just, just telling you, there's no power in the oil. The power is in the process. The power, let me say it, the power is not in the oil. The power is in the process of having grown folk conversation sitting down. The reason why I anoint you with oil is so you will know as a symbol that God is with you. That when you go to have a conversation, you're not going by yourself, amen, and remind you that you represent him and that you need to make sure that your character and your communication reflects your Christianity. Y'all don't hear me today. Glory to God. All right. That's good stuff. Helps us to live the simplified life. Because I go through life believing people are going to disappoint me. I, don't, I, I put tens on people's heads, but I expect anybody can hurt me. Them little kids, I had, we had our children, and I looked at I remember Helen told and Talia and, John, and Jonathan in my arms, and I said, oh, y'all are so precious. It's a shame you're going to break my heart. From the very beginning, when I held my little babies and they hadn't done anything yet, they haven't done anything yet, amen, I looked at them with tears in my eyes, knowing that I would love them so much, knowing that they would love me, but knowing that we together would break each other's hearts, that I would disappoint them, that they would disappoint me, that we would have challenges, amen, and I looked at all of that over the years, and now they're 25, amen, and 21 years old, amen, and we have gone through those things, those stages, because I expect the cutie booty ooty is going to break my heart and I'm going to break yours too. <laughs> but I'm committed to work through it all. I'm committed to be there. I'm committed not to shut the door. I'm committed to love you when you're unlovable. I'm committed to be able, amen, to, to open up a trust. I'm, I'm like the father, the prodigal dad, who puts the ring on the finger and the robe on the back and I'll kill the fatted calf. My oldest son, who, who y'all know, Joseph, we all adopted, amen, I still carry in my, in my, right beside my bed, I still carry the ring that my daddy gave to me when I turned 18 years old. When I turned 18, me and my daddy, we all had struggles, my family, we had struggles. I wasn't a bad kid, but I was a bad kid. <laughs> when I turned 18, my dad came into the kitchen when I was washing dishes, and he took the ring that he had, he had bought when I was born. And he wore as a wedding ring and wore on his finger. And when I turned 18, as his eldest son, he, ha he gave me that ring. And I have kept that ring. And in fact, when I got married, that was the ring I got married with. When, my, when, when, when Joseph turned 18 years old, my wife bought me this ring. Went to Jared's. <laughs> Just a simple little ring. Because she knew that I wanted to take that ring off. And my son at 18, he was not ready. That's when schizophrenia started to happen in his life, and he wasn't ready to receive the ring. 
He, he's, he's not at the place where he needs to. But I told him, I sat him down in the room when he was in one of his rages and going through his, his mental challenges. And I sat him down and I showed him the ring. I said, I can't give this to you now. This is the ring that my daddy gave to me when I was 18. And now that you're 18 years old, and though you're not my biological child, you're my son. We changed your whole birth certificate to say that I'm the birth mom, I'm the birth daddy, and, my, and Tabitha's the birth mom. You have to go down to the judge, and they literally changed the birth certificate to say that you are the natural parents, even though we're not biological parents. And I said, you're my son, and I'm committed to you. And right now, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's drugs. I don't know if it's mental illness. I don't know what's going on with you, but I am in your life forever. But I cannot give you this ring today. But one day, I hope I don't keep going to cry through it. One day, the dream of my heart is that we will have a service in this building or someplace or at home or somewhere private or public, I don't care, to where he will have matured to the place where I can say my son who was dead is yet alive. Here is the ring. Here's the robe. Here are the sandals on your feet. Somebody ought to give God some praise. Because some of y'all right now have children who are out there in the world, out there doing things. Amen. And some of y'all say, I'll close the door. I'll shut the door. But turn the cheek. Keep the door open. Keep it open. Not just your kids, but family and friends and parents, and brothers and sisters. Keep the door open. I'm not going to say all this other stuff I had. I think the Lord said it. This ain't, I, if you come to eight, just get to 8 o'clock service and it's a whole different message. <laughs> because I think God said what he wanted us to hear. Because it's about forgiveness. This communion that we see here is, is about forgiveness. No, Jesus is not on the cross any longer. He's come down from the cross. He's not in the tomb because the tomb is empty. And so every first Sunday of the month in this church, we come to this table to remember what he did for us. To remember that we have been forgiven so much and therefore how can we not forgive? How can we not help? How can we not restore? Because so much has been forgiven of us. We need to do the same for them. So as we close this service today, we're going to take Holy Communion together. And we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. We're going to remember the sacrifice. We're going to first say, Lord, forgive me. We got to get the junk out the trunk first. We got to get the clutter out of our hearts. That's the sin that we've kept up. So if there's any sin in your heart, in your life right now, you confess it and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the sin. Forgive me for the mess that I've allowed to, to, to come into my heart and my life, to gather and collect in my soul. I want to declutter my soul by first asking you to forgive me and then to forgive those who hurt me. Because how can I love you who I've not seen and not love my brothers and my sisters, my family and my friends that I see every day? So, Father, bless this communion time. Set it apart, these elements apart for your divine use. We thank you for what you will say and what you will do today. Thank you for what you've said to us. There's some in this room who needed to hear what we said, what you said through me today. What didn't get said because, Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that you will allow your Holy Spirit to keep preaching to them. Don't let this sermon end with a good amen and sending this congregation out to their homes. Let this sermon continue through the week. Yes, Lord, through, this, through the month, really through our lifetime. And we give you thanks and praise. Bless these elements.